Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Rabbit Trail Podcast. This is episode number 139. 139. 139. And uh, this is the uh, podcast where, guess what? <laughs> we chase the truth wherever it runs. We're glad that you guys are joining with us. Um, my name is Greg Harris, senior pastor at All Branch Community Church, the church that sponsors the podcast, and probably your church. We're just glad that you're joining with us today. So we're going to be diving into things uh, that we pretty much left on the cutting room floor when it came to the sermon and comments and questions you guys have sent to us. And we're just going to let the rabbits run. You guys ready to go chase them? Sure. All right. Yeah. Say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi. Hello. My name is Stephen uh, Oldham. Hi, I'm the local Steven. outreach. Co- Hello. Pastor. Pastor here. Yeah. Not almost coordinator. a coordinator. You almost mm. did it. Yeah. Still getting used to that, but <laughs> thank you guys for watching. We're so glad that you're watching even during this uh, election year and you haven't like, you know, burned down any of their YouTube channels or done anything crazy, but we're glad you're Don't watching. Don't give anybody <laughs> any ideas. <laughs> yeah, glad you're watching. Glad you're commenting. Um, so thank you for watching the shorts and just the videos. But if you are watching on YouTube, make sure you give us a like and subscribe and hit the bell and you'll get all of the content from our church and everything else that we do here at the Rabbit Trail but if you're watching somewhere or listening somewhere else, let us know by subscribing and let us know how you hear it. Comment there as well. We'll give us a reason to go look at Apple because some people do comment there every so often, but it's like not nearly as much as YouTube. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my name is Brent Branch. And I'm the Connections Pastor here at Olive Branch Church. And uh, oh, this is Refreshing Water by Members Mark. We want to thank our new sponsor, Sam's Club, for the podcast as well. I don't well. think you can say that. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah. I'm lying, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I get no product placement. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, and that was Sam's Club with a Z, not an apostrophe S. Wow, so we're going we, even we, more we, generic. <laughs> like, first you had like <laughs> so premium we, water, then you had Sam's we Club. Are, we are clear Sam's for infringement and, and, and fraud. President's but, Choice. Yes. Um, but my name Mr. is... Mr. Pepper. Yeah. It's, my name is Brent Branchard. Pepper I'm the connection Dr. pastor. Thunder. Dr. Thunder. Dr. Fluffy. Dr. <laughs> Thunder. Um, and, uh, and I just want to say, we appreciate your comments. We appreciate your questions. We would love to discuss them. We have plenty of them today. Um, and you can just send your questions. They don't have to be relevant to the topic. They could be any theological or life situation make questions. make useful. And we would be happy to, uh, to chew on it and answer those questions for you as best we can. And you can send them to rabbittrail at obcc.church, rabbittrail at obcc.church. And we look forward to seeing them and talking about them. All right, what's pretty crazy is I'm looking at like you know, on Apple, what's pretty cool is you guys, when we do our podcast, they will actually like put our transcripts on. Oh, do they? Yeah, and so it's, it's funny. Last week says, this is episode number 100, 138. And then you say 138. And you say like 138. And it just says 138, 138, 138. <laughs> ah, and like I love the transcript. It's so accurate. So yep. I just, just thought that was funny as I was looking looking over that real quick. So, That's all funny. right, bro, what are we up to, man? You got any? What's, what's happening? Jokes. There? Oh, no. Jokes, baby. No. I got jokes coming out my ears. All right. So, we are recording this on Wednesday, October 30th. Tomorrow is Halloween. So first off, I want to say I ask that question. I want to yeah. say tomorrow is Halloween, and Greg, I just want to let you know that I will be coming in to work tomorrow as a ghost. So you may not see me, but I will be here. <laughs> um, but anyway, two two jokes. One of these was sent in by Debbie. She asked me not to give her credit for it because I don't think she thought it was the greatest joke, and I told her I would because um, <laughs> I don't want everybody to think I came up with this. Uh, why do all witches wear the same black outfit? So it's hard to tell which witch is which. Oh. oh wow. That, but, that's a good third grade level right there. That it's is like, a good one. I mean, and, straight but this out of the, Phantom Tollbooth. This is the one I thought was funny, and I brought it up, I think, just a few months ago and said, I, it's a Halloween one, so I'm going to save it for Halloween. So Brian, Brian, this is your joke that you sent me that I thought was very funny um or very cute but why is it so cheap to throw a party at a haunted house because the ghosts bring their own booze Booze. (laughs) that's funny right there i don't care who you are (laughs) does this thing on yeah exactly hey hello hello and we wonder why the views are going down (laughs) maybe we shouldn't 
Maybe we should close with this segment instead of open with it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm Give just saying. I, We're going to put a poll out. <laughs> yeah. Don't say views are coming down when I read Kevin, when I read Brian's jokes because uh, he sends me jokes. And oh. I, I don't no, want no, to never dis- mind. There I don't want to discourage him. I like that joke. Thanks, Brian. That was a good one. I've been saving it for months. Why did you? Did you notice he just did there? Yeah. He's like, I'm not owning my own jokes. I'm throwing other people under the bus. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what was that? Yes. <laughs> but I also told him how great they are. Mm-hmm. So keep sending in your jokes. All right, so anyway, we're going to move on forward to the other side of the world, the dark side mm. of the interweb with Stephen's first impressions. Yeah, we had a few comments. Not as many as I would have thought on the political one, so that's interesting. Maybe it wasn't out very long. Well, yeah, because uh, the shorts might have been out as long, but we'll probably get more. Uh, special on politics good for you guys taking a stand uh, on firm on pro-life although i'm an abolitionist versus an incrementalist uh, incrementalism approach which is what we talked about on yeah. there yeah. so and that's perfectly and acceptable say, position to hold but i would say to that at our heart everybody is an abolitionist oh, on yeah, this, yeah, yeah. right at yeah. our heart but from a practicality standpoint you know i hope it was clear we we want to move the needle you know toward abolition you know um but our heart would be abolitionist but from a practical standpoint we need to make headway and make gains in the in is the it process. abolition or abolution is Brent it's making absolution up new words? oh no not absolution oh no we're we not that one <laughs> but yeah i've always heard there's a theory like that there was this theory about uh, uh, abolitionism abol- abolitionism in slavery time periods and they always argued you needed both. You needed the the strong idealist abolitionists to stand there and hold the pl- hold the marker line. Like we are outlining this. We are outlining oh, the this. Plant the flag. Yeah, and so that that so that there could never be a movement away from the ultimate end goal. Right. And if you don't have somebody stand there with the absolute ab ab ab. Abolition, abol- you got me all messed up I now. Know, Abolitionist, abolition of this um, the abolishment issue. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going with abolition the whole time. We're, we it's got like the evolution of abolitionism. <laughs> We've got the evolution of ab- yeah. abolition. So the and but then the incrementalist always is there to fight forward, and so you needed almost both at the time period, and it was. Um, it was the tensions that enabled it to keep going in the right direction mm. and not revert. Had yeah. it just only gone to incrementalists, it was easy that somebody else could hold the flag on the opposite side and pull it back. But as long as the absolutists stand firm, it will continue to drive the wedge towards that incremental. Well, even in the same way, like in a war, right? You know what the what the. What the end re- end objective, but you take it the one objective? hill. Yeah, we're having fun but you take it today. one hill at a time, right? You know, you can't just go. Well, we're not going to take any hills if we can't just start off at the at the end of the objective. But we have nuclear. Uh, we do have nuclear capabilities nu- that might nuclear? end it. Nuclear. No. <laughs> nu- nuclear. <laughs> nuclear. Nuclear. On a on a serious note, no. <laughs> <laughs> on an intelligent note. No, I, I would say though, uh, anybody who's an incrementalist is still going to want to continue to the end of the line if he really believes in the issue. The problem with most people is they just want it to get out of the way, so their compromise is just to ignore the the conflict. So if you're someone who likes to compromise and then move on, then that's the problem because we had that with slavery in the first place yeah. the, with the Great Compromise. So that's really really the difference is, is you don't want to uh, you don't want to stop pushing forward and just be like okay I'm done we compromised everybody's you not happy and happy yeah, so you're just making it worse so right. Right. yeah that's the one now this next one is related to the myth of Jesus as a fictional character and so Bradley Ma- Ma- Mastin Mastin I guess he just likes lots and lots of exclamation points and he's saying that Jesus. I like lots and lots of. He said Jesus. Points. He was dot dot dot. Here was myth and fiction dot 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 exclamation point, exclamation point. I saw it with my own eyes. I don't know what that means, but it was very important for Jesus him. Jesus was fiction, and he saw it with his own eyes. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, yeah, that sounds humorous. It is. It he's is. trolling. Yeah. So I just want him to read it the way he wrote it. So he was trolling. But, well, he spelled he and here here was. So yeah. I mean, so there you, you go. How do you see something that never existed with your own eyes? That, 
I got the joke. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you're you're in charge of the first impressions. I'm in charge of the comedy. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to make I wanted to comedic explain oh, to you. Yeah. Can somebody yeah. please explain it's what I'm always, doing here because I don't have. It's always idea. better when someone explains the jokes, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. It's, it really know, works. Humor best that way. works yeah. best when you have to explain it. Yes. So yeah, I admire funny jokes. I guess I just was wondering why, why there were so many exclamation points. Uh, and then the other one was uh, in relation to uh, why your congressman matters from more than the president. This was when you were talking about influencing your congressman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The person took offense to this and said the the Supreme Court, his name is David Stratman 8232. I didn't realize there were that 8,232 8, David Stratmans in mm. the world. So Maybe I don't know. he graduated in. Maybe. Uh, the Supreme Court tried to stop Biden's illegal actions and he ignored them. If the executive colludes with the DOJ and the Senate, this guy is full of, and then he uses the British word for feces. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so um, there you go, Pastor. Well, yeah, I, <laughs> just you. kidding. I really appreciate that, man. No, I, um, I, I think this is funny. The quick response that most people will give. Yeah, really, but, it's but, not my um, idea. I was, I'm just uh, was listening to a, a, a concept <laughs> called Madison, who wrote these things called the Federalist Papers. Yeah, who argued that the Congress was supposed to be the most powerful branch. It's not until you get to Woodrow Wilson, who literally transforms because he was a political science doctor the one of the few doctorates of presence was a horrible president but he um and i'll get comments on that because i don't know i just don't like wilson he was a racist and he was a absolute horrible president but he also transformed the and came up with the concept of the vigorous executive who was going to get stuff done and when that happens you polarize the place now our judiciary ha- used to be a a judiciary that was trying to produce law um, and that has stopped with originalism um, now we're checking the we're checking back the president's power through the judiciaries and we're checking back and the goal really in an originalist position is for them to point back to Congress and say well this is this law is not clear Congress needs to fix it and then and that that's on people don't like that people who like corporate business and get it done kind of stuff they don't like red gridlock tape. and red tape and which is bureaucracy. good for government not for business it's definitely good for federal government not good in war and therefore no. the executive is supposed to have the power in war yeah but that's not um but that's not what is supposed to be in creating law a knee-jerk reactionary uh, policy making and stuff like that. So again, so the power really ought to be. Let, let me try to steel man the argument. Yeah. So, okay, what do you do then if there are collusions between branches and then how does that affect the Senate? And I can answer that myself, but I just wanted to hear what you guys thought. Because I do think like some people think everything's corrupt. So we, you know, so they're kind of upset, you know, and that's that's where people see collusion, they see corruption, and then they well, just get mad. Yeah, I think first is um, to inform those around you of what you know, have the conversations and build consensus as best you can. And if you can grow it, throw the bums out. Personally, I, I like Yuvalovin's concept of like growing the size of the um, local, re- no, the representatives yeah. um, that the U.S. representatives in the House ought to be probably 150 people more to represent more localized yeah, local we, representation one representative is like something has to deal with like large large swaths of county people like you can't meet all those people and it was they actually they it's been since the 1970s since we expanded the house of representatives and we we probably need to do it again if we're going to get back to some beefier local things like power. that but if there's a collusion like honestly you've got to so you've got to make us stink yeah, I just think that um, so like if you if you know things are corrupt, I don't think the response is to just be mad. I think even if you are angry, you have to ask what's the most effective way to fight a particular situation. And I still think that would be influencing the person who's your representative that lives closest to you. Mm-hmm. So even if everything is corrupt, then pointing out the corruption in your local and community and showing that this is collusion and how, and you have facts and you have support groups and you, you get involved is really with what you need to do with your anger. Otherwise you just get mad and sit there and just yell at everybody. And I don't know how effective that is. I understand the frustrations that people express about politics and, and and I do think there's a lot of corruption. I just think that uh what what is your what is your source as an individual to do something to be effective? I don't but what I don't want to do is let my knee jerk reaction dictate um how I respond to other people because I could be turning away allies 
and I could also be turning away my influence that I do have. So I always, I just caution because I see people get mad and then I go, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, it's like when you see a kid that's really upset, he punched me in the face and you're like, and yeah, now what? Now what are you going to do? And you're both going to get in trouble, you know, so it's just like asking the question, like after you're angry, <laughs> even if it's justified, what, what, what do you want to do? And most people are just like, I don't know. I don't want to do anything. I'm just mad. I just don't want to deal with this anymore. And I get that, but I don't know if it's effective. Mm. So, Locus well, of control is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're talking about federal level. Well, you're not in control. And that's the hard part about you, democracy. Well, but, and, and we try to claim, we try in America, we love to tell everybody you are in control. Yeah. You're in control of your body. You're in control of your, your car. You're in control of your government. You're, you're, but, and then suddenly you're not in control of some major things. They're going to tell you what to do with, with your life. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah. That's called living in a government to, like we were the freest people in the world we got really used to I think that. that you think we've gotten used to our freedoms and the truth is that's not you something fight for them, everybody's right. experienced to throughout history either nope mm-hmm. and back um, very few I've been to other countries and it's they're not free like we are so. and also there's nothing that a government can do to take away the freedom that God gives you and the ability to have to make a positive change in those people around you even when everything's going downhill you don't have to jump downhill with it um, you can make a little pocket because I think about people living in communist countries who are trying to make community with this dictatorship, you know, and I would say there are good people in those countries who are trying to make a living or trying to live and they're trying to be good. A lot of Christians there, too. So they have a will to make life better, even in the midst of a terror, you know, or, and that's what many Christians have done for centuries, you know, living under dictatorships and things. So. Mm-hmm. So welcome to our political podcast part two, and we are moving on to the sermon this week. So, uh, so again, um, we are in this uh, sermon series, Magnetic, um, which really is uh, just the idea that that either it's um, Christ is pulling you magnetically, or you're repelling against Christ. Um, and so, this one we started out with the 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 sower, the you know, sower of the seed. Pro, um, Mark chapter Proverb, four, or parable, pro, yeah, parable. Then Mark chapter four, verse one through twenty. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, Mark four, one through twenty. Yeah, um, you know. So we did talk about that. Um, so I do have a question from one of the from one of the sermon points. But if you wanted to discuss the seed, we can do that. Or well, I mean, if for those of get people who've never who, read I mean, Mark, you know, you can read it for yourself. It, it's pretty much a simple parable of. There is a person who's throwing out seed, and the seed's falling on different kinds of soils. You've got hard pack soil, and it grows up, springs up quickly, and the pigeons, which are the spawn of Satan, come and eat it up. And which is the weirdest thing? Like I made that joke, like wasn't really a joke because I do think that they're pretty evil. You don't think but, seagulls are worse? Um, they're the spawn at the <laughs> at beach. the beach. So the uh, <laughs> but the, pi- the like, pigeons of the beach. I don't know. Like they got <laughs> scary because somebody's really mad at me about the pigeon thing because I found a half dead pigeon in my front yard when I got home. Oh yesterday. wow! So really? But we have a. It's kind of like the Godfather scene where yeah, you have a like horse, horse head in your bed. Yeah. Whoa! So somebody's but, sending you yeah, a message. Like, well, maybe they're like, I don't like pigeons either. Yeah, maybe. Well, we, no, I maybe think we should we send them have a fish wrapped in newspaper <laughs> we actually we have a hawk that lives by our oh house, yeah so i think that hawk nailed it i'm like kind of wow. like scooping up going like good job hawk. what a time you know, we time to oh, do it's that though. freaky right so and it's a harris hawk oh, oh, oh. boom he doesn't like the hoa harris either is my last name just so people know so, all right so um you end up with this situation where that's land on the ground it's the seeds are growing and they get burned off because they don't have any root you know in the shallow soil and then there is a the rocky soil as jesus calls it it's just too shallow not enough grows up sun comes it dies third is it grows up in these weeds and gets choked out so it doesn't ever bear any fruit and then the four soil falls in the good tilled up soil and it grows up and produces lots of fruit multiplies it 30 60 and 100 fold and so and then he goes those who have ears let them hear and then they get away and Disciples are like, what's it mean? What's it mean? And yeah. Jesus kind of lays out, this is a story about the story. This is a meta story. And the story is about me. And there's, there's a lot of layers to this onion. Um, oh, but, yeah. But, you know, but then the point you made when you did that, when it's like, let them have ears, uh, let them who have ears uh, hear, you, you said those who are interested lean in to learn the story so you were talking about you know the disciples leaning in going tell us more what does this mean and they're looking for clarity in that 
um, parable. Um, and I, when you said that, and I kind of wrote in my notes too, was we also see this model with Jesus when it comes to evangelism too, right? When he shared what you needed to do to be a follower of his, you know, those who were not interested, they walked away. Now, Jesus didn't choose uh, to chase them down, you know, um, he let them walk away. Um, he shared with those who leaned in, you know, and, and wanted to be his followers, and, and he kept sharing with them. So often we continue to, to chase people down and scream, listen to me, I got to convince you, you know, especially when it comes time to, uh, for evangelism and stuff. So how should we shape our mentality um, uh, or our approach to evangelism when it comes to this? You know, should we chase people down? Should we try to be convincing everybody? Um, should we have more of that Jesus approach where I tell you something and if you lean in, I'm going to share more with you. And if you pull away, I'm going to let you pull away and I'm not going to continue to hammer you, you know, hammer being a bad <laughs> word. I don't, you know. Do you, uh, do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it's, it's first off, it's good to look at the process Jesus uses. He doesn't start necessarily with parables. Like uh, a lot of the commentaries I was reading were saying that a th like a third of this, a third of that, and a third of this, and many, many parables were used by many rabbis at the time. But if you look at the messages before this, he's performing miracles. He's also preaching rather clearly in synagogues. And then as people start to just be more of a, an odd crowd, then he starts to switch to parables. Um, and so the, the disciples are starting to join him and others are just starting to follow him. And he starts giving parables to people to see if they'll press in. So I think it's a strategy there. I think you see Jesus using his strategy that leads up to his ministry um, on seeing, well, if you really want to press in, I'm just going to put a little curiosity in you. If you're not curious about God at all, then you'll walk away. If you are, it'll bring you towards us. And in that, I find a similarity to some of the uh, uh, the ideas of putting a pebble in someone's shoe, where you're not always just like, do you know Jesus is your personal Lord today? And you hit him really heavy, but you're just at getting them to think about their worldview a little bit so that something is gnawing on them. Well, how do you know anything is true? How do we, you know, people say, well, I just believe in, you know, human rights. I go, well, who, who determines that? If it's not God, who, who determines that? We just make it up. And so then what Hitler did was fine. And you're just like, I don't think you have this robust idea of how to treat human beings unless you have something like God that objectively knows what's true and gives it to all of us and provides that for us. Other than that, you're just making it up. And that kind of gets people thinking. And then that might be all that I say. And I kind of walk away. I didn't talk about, you know, you need Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I didn't talk about all these things, but I put something in there. So if you're curious, you will press in. But if you're not curious, you'll be like, oh, you're crazy. You're off your walker. You'll walk away. And I've had those conversations, but there's this need to think that that isn't spiritual. And I think you have to be able to triage a situation sometimes and figure, well, what would be the best thing? You know, if the guy's talking about science, then I might chat him up a bit if I don't know him and then throw out some things that might get him thinking. And then if they have an opportunity, I might be more direct, but sometimes I don't have that opportunity. So I do think that I like to see that Jesus isn't stuck in just parables. He just never talked in anything but parables, but I think he was aware of his audience, what they needed to hear and how he would either push them away or draw them. Or yeah, but like the rich young ruler and stuff, you know, he came to him and said, and he said, this is what you need to do. And he's like, oh, okay. And he starts walking off. You don't see Jesus running down the pathway going, wait, wait, let me, you let know. Let me accommodate yeah, your thinking. Exactly. Well, I don't want to change let's, the gospel. Let's have some more conversations and see if I can convince you. And I think that there's a principle, and Jesus lays this principle out in multiple places. Find here in Luke 8, 18, it says, Take care then how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. Mm -hmm. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. This shows up in a lot of other parables, like with the minas or the talents. This idea or judging that, people. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I tell you, it'll be more. And so you, it, this concept of having more, having a measure, m receiving it, you'll get more. And this is that lean in principle. And I do, I do think that there's a tendency that we we push where we shouldn't be pushing. I mean, the proverbs say, "Answer a fool according to his folly, and he'll turn around and bite you." right don't answer a fool according to his folly and he'll feel like he's the greatest guy since sliced bread and it, basically the whole point is just, just leave it alone and i think jesus 
it kind of shows us off in his uh he teaches he preaches those who are willing to lean in they lean in i mean we don't see the stories where people um will go he goes come follow me and they go nah because we we want to they they record the ones where they did follow him there might have been people who said nah we don't know um we also know that there are people that said, I'll follow you. And he goes, really? Foxes have holes. He's like, I'm going to challenge what you think you have. Hmm. And because what does he want them to do? He wants them to kind of go like, oh, I got to count this cost. <clears throat> there is a sense. Yeah, that and we- he even tells people like, before you say yes, count the cost. You know, make sure that you can afford this. Right. There, there is a sense that we are a little too. Accommodating. Com- accommodating, easy believism, they call it, that kind of a thing. Because uh, you have this balance between that it is a gift given to you freely that you have to choose and receive, and it is um, a challenging faith that changes you. Like I'm having conversations with young Christians, and you know they just, especially in this political climate, and in a lot of ways they just don't realize how you know that what the Word of God means, or that you know your bo- your body belongs to the Lord. Like that's a critical piece. Mm-hmm. And in anything, you don't own yourself. You are not your own. Is like die to yourself. Yeah, you have to, like the stuff that Jesus is calling for is not easy. And if they're willing to lean in, then you can keep going. You can keep giving them more. And I think that Jesus does this to those who are leaning in. He gives them more. You lean in again. He gives you more. You lean in again. He gives you more. This is the. This is how. To- but also having discernment um, of whether they are asking real questions that they want answers to, or if they're scoffers who are just, you know, throwing, throwing stuff out there to just derail you and get off topic and everything else. So I do think there's that aspect of, 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 of understanding who really is willing to, to listen and take in and, and has valid questions and then invest in those. I mean, like, one of the things, too, is, you know, kind of my philosophy when it comes to helping people and caring for people, providing meals for people that are going through a rough or difficult time. You know, my thought, too, is, okay, there is an aspect of hospitality that I am aware of, but there's also the, sign, the thing of don't run around helping people that don't need help, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, you could spend all of your time and your resources and everything else helping people that don't need your help, helping people that don't really necessarily want your help, and then neglecting those people that do because you don't have enough time. You know, So investing in the willing, I think, is appropriate. Respecting somebody's free will in that respect, too, and, and allowing them to make a decision to, you know, for or against is important. Well, I think that they're, if they're asked, yeah, you help. There's a, but there needs to be a point of challenge. Um, and that's really what Jesus does. He's willing to heal anyone who comes. Mm-hmm. But then he draws a point of challenge. He's like, are you here for the power? Are you here for the money? Are you here for the goods? Are you here for the, right? Churches, have, we have to deal with this. I don't think people realize how often we have to deal with people coming to church for a i just want the community or b i'm just here because i have this great need and i need somebody to pray for me or c i need some money or whatever it is and we have to you have to like one say absolutely welcome we we're glad you're here and then the danger is as a pastor as a as as a group of pastors as a as a disciple who's sharing is to then blunt the sharp edges of the challenge like this is sin well i don't want to call it sin maybe we should call it something else we'll imply it's sin well it's like i feel that that stress but jesus didn't feel that stress because he was so confident the truth was truth 
because it was the truth. And so he doesn't, you don't need to blunt anything because there is supposed to be a challenge. There is supposed to be a winnowing effect that occurs in people's lives. And that's what I think this parable is about. He's like, look, there are winnowing effects. One, some don't even hear it. Two, some hear it and then hard things come and they walk away. Some hear it and they get so consumed with other things, they they just don't ever produce fruit. They're just kind of sitting there. Right. So that there's a winnowing effect that, that occurs, and Jesus is bringing this challenge. That's why he's, that's what he's saying here. I'm doing this winnowing effect with these stories. I'm challenging people. Will they lean in? Stephen, you now, want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I do. I, in response a little bit to what you said, too, I do think it's okay to help those who can't help themselves. But I think that, I didn't say that. But you know what I mean? Like, if, if someone doesn't want help, there might be an opportunity to still help them. But there's a difference between doing that for the sake of the gospel and doing that forever because you're accommodating the fact that they don't want to change and you're not challenging them like you're saying. What I mean by that is the seed is thrown to everyone. The soil determines what it wants to do. But I think if you keep throwing it away in the bad area and bad area and expect it to produce, that's going to be odd. And so to me, the idea of sometimes I will help someone who might be a belligerent neighbor just because I want to uh, show them that God loves them and it may not produce anything that I can see. And I might do that on a consistent basis. But if I never get to a point where I get close enough to challenge him, like, why are you so grumpy? Then I'm not really helping him in the long run. He's just staying grumpy, right? And so I do feel like sometimes the first pitch is often a, I will help to help to show people that this is genuine. But as you get closer, as you get in relationship, if you never challenge them, then you are just uh, capitulating to their bad desires and, and their lack of change. So so for me, I do think that uh, it is like, a, like I said, a triage type of thing where you have to evaluate whether or not um, that person is willing to change. But that's the hard part because it's more of a long-term relational thing. Now, yeah. you, you had said that, <clears throat> number one, it, you know, Jesus didn't have a problem calling out people's sin, and it's uncomfortable to do that in today. And I do feel like we don't have a realistic um, view of the destruction of sin, right? Um, whether it be just in general, people don't really understand how devastatingly destructive sin is, and we take it a little lightly. Um, and even you as a pastor, me as pastors, it's uncomfortable to call somebody out on sin sometimes. And, and so part of it is like, how much of that is, is our lack of really understanding that too? Because, and the reason I say that is this, if somebody was going to eat Drano, we would have no problem going, stop, stop, stop. You know, that is really dangerous. That will kill you, you know. But then when it comes to sin, and granted, it's a little more multi-layered, but we don't necessarily have that purity of of yelling stop 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 where no, Jesus no, I, did. I actually don't think people have I don't think it's hard uh, here's the thing I don't think it's as hard to yell stop 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 I, I think that's actually most people have an easy time like going no 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 don't don't live with your girlfriend and sleep with her like that's a bad idea like hey like if you if you have a relationship and you're there you, you I think most most Christians are are pretty good at that kind of thing. Now there are those pet subjects like, Hey, you know, yeah, yeah, dude, don't, don't go in that direction with your sexuality or hey, no, don't, don't, don't get involved with that gang there. Like there are some dangerous things, but I think most of the time when we are addressing sin, we're addressing it in the rear. They've already sinned and we're having to point it out to them. So now it's personal. Now it's, they're a failure. Now it's, they've done something wrong. Now it's, and that's when we feel uncomfortable. I think we're kind of like, I have to be like the jerk who has to point out your garbage and that sucks because I don't want to be that guy, but that's that prophetic role of the gospel. You have to lay out the truth as mm-hmm. Jesus point does multiple times and it just takes the Pharisees to task. What I, what I really can't stand is people who abs- like abscond and avoid like, oh, I'm not a Pharisee because that's the religious leaders. Mm. No, we're all Pharisees. Like that, that's I mean, we put all yourself in that seat. I mean, we all try to figure our way. We're all really good lawyers in our heads when we get around things, and we all want to be the disciples. When oftentimes we're we're all really the bad guys, and so I think because we don't identify well, we either come across meanly in the way that we do it because we're not practiced in it. Um, I know I can come across. I have to like like get myself energized up in certain scenarios to say something. 
and in some other scenarios, it's really easy to do it compassionately. Like, right. I'm so sorry. Like, man, you know, but you know that sin. And There's, I do feel like part difference. of that too is that compassionate part, for, you know, is, is the relationship level too. You know, if, if I have a relationship with somebody and I feel that they like me as a person and they know I like them as a person, it is easier to have those conversations than somebody I don't really have a relationship right. with because then part of it is you f- you're afraid that you're coming off as judgmental, you know, black and white without any compassion, you know, and, uh, and we'll get into that for one of the questions, but, well, let's you know, go there. that broken hearted yeah. part, huh? Let's go there. Go there now? <laughs> I don't know. Let's, okay. let's just, um, yeah. I don't want to get too caught in this. I feel yeah. like we've answered the question. So. Right. Um, uh, and so, uh, so one of the other things um, you talked about in your sermon was um, you had mentioned, you know, once saved, always saved. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. <laughs> you did. Can you bring that up, please? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the but you, you, were, you brought up once saved, always saved, and you even said, you know, if you guys want to talk to me after the sermon, I'm not going to get into that right now, but if you want to talk to me nobody later. <clears throat> I know, nobody did. So um, either everybody has... Has has a position and they're comfortable in it, or well, some people. Um, uh, I'm glad you addressed it that way, though, because we did have a conversation about it in one of the small groups I was in. Did you? They just they thought about because we had the conversation before Greg preached, so I was like giving a little bit of a preview, but not too much because I was like trying to mm-hmm. encourage them to listen to the. And he's like, I do struggle with this because it's like in one chance it says like you know the seeds there, and then but you're supposed to be open to the seed, but then. God knows the outcome, and so he's just like, I don't understand how this process works in the parable, and it can be confusing even in the context of the parable for some to think like, well, doesn't he know? Why is he casting seed on places that it's not going to grow? And then do they have a choice really because he knows the outcome anyway? And so they were they were kind of stuck in that that space. Nice. And I think it's helpful to go put that aside for right now and then make sure you really focus in on the meaning, and then you can double back around to having that kind of complex how does the mechanism work? Um, um, yeah, so you know, you had mentioned uh, once saved, always saved. You mentioned you talked about it. You said some will receive it and could walk away. Um, so I just kind of wanted to have that discussion right now. Is you know, basically, there's three, and I'm, there's probably more, but there's three primary views on this, right? So one of them is once you're saved, always saved. You know, and the argument of that is is basically. If someone genuinely received Christ, they're secure in their salvation because it's grounded in God's sovereignty rather than our human will, right? There's the position, the other position that um, the scriptures declare that, you know, God speaking says, I gave them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand, which sounds like a once saved, always saved verse. But the argument is, Right. God says your, your salvation is secure with him. Nobody, no outside force can pluck you from his hand, but you can remove yourself from the equation, right? So no outside force is going to snatch your salvation, but you could choose to rebel against it and walk away. Um, and then thirdly, um, you know, that you can lose your salvation. You know, and this view holds that salvation is conditional upon continued faithfulness and persistent sin or an apostasy can lead to the loss of salvation. So um, what say you guys on these three positions? Yes. 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 <laughs> oh, <next> Ding <laughs> dong. Um, okay, so I have a tendency to have a problem with this the, the way that the idea is framed because the Bible talks from multiple perspectives. If God knows that you're saved, and we're talking now from God's viewpoint, he is certain of your salvation. He's certain you will be saved. Then, and when you're saved, he knows you're saved. You will all be saved. Like, because salvation at that point, legitimate means a transformation. You've been made anew. You've been born again. You've been transformed. Um, there is this sudden, and God, it says that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, which would include yourself, mm-hmm. will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there, there is this, 
this sense in the scriptures that they want that the the authors want you to have a full 100% assurance that if you have given your allegiance to Jesus if you are depending upon him he is dependable to you so when it comes to this i think if you've thrown your dependence upon Christ he is 100% dependable and will and will will not leave you nor forsake you he's he's never going to separate from you um, now, what does that look like on a human perspective in a, t- in a temporal si- situation? I mean, for God, when you're saved, you're saved, right? It's just that's how he knows you as saved. If I know you, Brent, and I know you as saved in 1988, but I see you in 1990, 1990 what am I thinking? Dude's not saved anymore. Like, what happened, right? Like, yeah. I mean, like, what? This was, guy was on fire in high school. Like, he doesn't even care now. Like what? What's going on? I may be getting my dates wrong here, but nineteen eighty is uh, nineteen seventy nine or eighty is when I gave my life to the Lord. Yeah. So, but at some point in there, you started away. being complacent in your faith, and so like I've had friends who are so dogmatic about their faith. I mean, these this guy was running a Bible study of two hundred plus kids. He knew he was he knew John Piper, John or John MacArthur was friends with them, going to his school, sent as the prize student to Jerusalem for training there, comes back, doesn't believe in the Trinity, walks away from the faith. He now works over at USC and actively tries to recruit kids away from Jesus. What do you do with that? Hmm. But I mean temporally, from my perspective, he was saved I had no reason to doubt if he had died that day before he had gone to Jerusalem, he would have gone to heaven. But he didn't, and now he's an apostate. Legitimately was a guy in the church, learned all this stuff, was a teacher, and now he's actively working against it. So on a temporal perspective, did he lose his salvation? Look, I think that we have enough assurance that you can't accidentally lose your salvation. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really what they're just like. You can't just accidentally well, wake up one day and like, Oh, I guess I'm not saved anymore. Whoops. Like, and this is to assure you that look, yeah, you'll sin. Yes. You'll run into demonic powers. Yes. You'll go through things in times. If you love Jesus, come back and keep walking. I mean, I think cause he's not rejected you. There's no final exit. Um, except in Hebrews. Right? What does mm. Hebrews say? I was getting there. I mean, Hebrews and the Her Hebrews favorite verses, scary. This is our Halloween verse. Yeah, for the day. yeah this Hebrews is Halloween. Scary, if this y'all. doesn't scare Ooh. the boo out of you, um, booze, and I will say, this should that, scare the booze out of all yeah, of you. Exactly. The um, and I will say these two verses, and it's not two verses, two sections, were something that in my youth um, in growing in Christ, these were the my go-to verses because it just scared me enough to like, I need to take my my faith seriously. So Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up for contempt. So basically, you're taking the sacrifice of Christ and you're spinning on it, you know? You're disrespecting um, his work and, and everything else. And Hebrews 10, 26 through 29 are basically the same. And I think it goes into the 30s, but it's basically reiterating that statement too. So in that, well, this talks about the knowledge and, and really kind of being enlightened by the Holy Spirit, you know, is that, um, and, and tasted the heavenly gift, would, would people look at that verse, especially people who believe that once saved, always saved, as a genuine conversion, and then they've fallen away, and it's impossible to come back? Or was it not really a commitment? Was it more of a knowledge and not really a transformation, or was it a loss of salvation? Do I try this one? Um, yeah, well, uh, there's a lot that we've been talking about, but one of the things I do want to say is I think that there's a difference between what I can see and what I can know. Um, as a human being, what I see appears to be how the scriptures define it. I see someone who is appearing to have fruit. I don't know if the fruit is real or if it just it looked fruitful to me, 
but I'm not the one who's the final judge of that decision. So I have to, to act on what is in front of me and what has been given. So from my perspective, it looks like they were saved and they've given up that proclamation of faith that they had. Now the question really becomes, did they, was it ever deeply rooted in them? Are they one of the other soils? And I don't know what happens if, from God's point of view. Once it plants, God sees it. He knows it's going to come to fruition because that's the good soil. I, I think I can see the good soil, but I know that I can't see it like God can. So I act on what's in front of me and how the scripture describes it. And it describes it as someone who's capable of professing faith and walking away. Now, the scary part is you can have a, there are a lot of biblical figures in the Old Testament who have a knowledge of God, but we always think because they know God, that means that they're saved. We have this impression that if you think if God is real and you think you know who he is and you're familiar with his ways, that you believe in him somehow, that you're loyal to him. And I don't think that's true. I think you can be aware of God. You can have, see God move and still not serve him. You and can choose. believe in his existence. Yeah, yeah. And you see this in a lot of figures like Balaam uh, is one who legitimately sees some weird kind of thing happen. Saul is another very eerie figure who's familiar enough with Yahweh but doesn't necessarily do what Yahweh says. Even able to prophesy in certain respects but doesn't surrender to him and so you're asking a question i don't think i can see i can only respond to what's been presented in front of me given what the instructions of the words are so people who who don't have to worry about their salvation are the ones that know that they love god and are going to actively pursue him like you would in a marriage like what would you do to someone who came before you and was like i really want to marry this girl but i don't really know if i'm going to be faithful to her well, you you know what I'm saying? Like, as like I worried that if I get married to her, that I'll I'll just want to be with everyone else and all this other stuff. You're like, okay, do you really want to get married? Or were you you know you're not ready for marriage. So, so I'm saying, so the idea of counting the cost for some people, sometimes you think they're saved because they went forward, but that really didn't happen there. It happened later on when they were like, oh, I don't know if I really I really think I'm I don't think I'm loyal. And they discover it and walk away and go, no, I don't really think I ever really believe. So I don't know what's going on, but I can see that being a possibility for some people. But I wouldn't know how, how God sees it. He probably knows exactly when someone accepts something that he knows, oh, that's a rooted person and they're, they're with me. And, and he makes choices by those decisions. Others, he wants them to see what soil they are. So they're without excuse, in my opinion. So when, I, when you see someone who's like, why would God sow seeds in a rocky ground? for the soil to see what it's made of. And I think that's what people discover about themselves. But that for me, it still feels the same. You were a brother and we were close and you believed in Jesus. And then all of a sudden you just walk away. It feels the same as the scripture describes. Anyway, that's kind of how I look at it. Now, so the soil that, that, that was on the hard soil or the seed that was the on rocky. the hard soil, yeah. um, not the rocky because the rocky the started, path. but it, it, the, the one that was on the hard path and the birds plucked yeah, it yeah, off. Yeah. Just, so, so to me, I've always looked at that as they didn't receive at all. There was no reception there. Yeah, it it was, just bounces off their brain and off right. the go. It's just like I, I t- completely reject it from the get-go, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. then the next one was I receive it, but, you know, I don't, I'm not sustained. Some argue mm-hmm. that this is, the, the rocky? this is what we're talking about, the rocky yeah. soil. These people you received, received it. You received it. At some level. But, but the then soil didn't persecution. receive it. The soil didn't receive well, it. Well, they it received it on, on a very the shallow oh, no, no, level. No, the second, the second, oh, the second level. one. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hebrews seems to be talking about. Right. Okay. Goes quickly but withers under the sun due to no roots. Right. Right. And the reason why is the last word. Read, keep reading in Mark. He says that uh, in the interpretation, he says, the sower sows the word, and these are the ones who along the path were sown and hear that the pigeons immediately sorry that satan immediately comes <laughs> and takes away the word that is sown in them and these are the Probably ones the sown on rocky ground the ones who were who when they heard the word immediately receive it with joy they have no root in themselves but endure for a while then when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word immediately they fall away uh, we can't ignore that the linking here is is clear that the author in Hebrews goes and he says, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, shared the Holy Spirit, have tasted goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. It sounds like they sounds are like kind of hanging mm-hmm. in the kingdom and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. That is a frightening verse to me. Like you 
Could literally. And I think fall away is important. You have to realize there's a difference between Judas and Peter. Yeah. Remember, Peter's going to Peter's going to be sifted. He is going to reject verbally Jesus, but when Jesus shows up, he's going to jump out of the boat. Judas is going to reject Jesus and go hang himself. Judas is soil dos. Like he is this he is the he is the soil on the rocky ground. Was he saved? Was he not saved? Uh, again, it's I, hard to see that. It's hard to. I mean, he tasted of these things. He was hanging around Jesus. He was seeing the Spirit of God work through him. And this is an interesting question people have asked: Can there be people who are near to Jesus in near to the church that see the power of God work through them, do miracles, even manifest aspects of the Spirit's gifting, and not be saved? Matthew and not have seven. Yeah. Right? right, Lord, yeah. Lord, didn't we do these things in, in your, your name? name? And then we'll just like that you can have love and exercise gift. You also see these figures in the Old Testament. Saul is, if you read Saul, it's like he he prophesies even when he's in disobedience. So it's just like then there's Eli who lives next to the presence of the Holy of Holies and still doesn't obey, and then mm-hmm. gets prophesied that you're going to get in tr- trouble. Doesn't repent at all. It's like how can you be familiar with God, live next to God, and then still decide I don't really need to re- uh, to. So so there's Admit. <laughs> a, yeah, and so there's a further association to this being associated to the the doctrine of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because this association fits where if the Spirit of God has worked through you a miracle, he's done, he's prophesied through, you've led somebody to Jesus, and then you, th- I mean, which would be a work of the Spirit through you, which yeah. my friend did. He led a lot of people to sure. Jesus. And they're and legitimate salvations. Him. And they are legitimate salvations. Um, and he throws it out. Some people would say it doesn't matter. He's going to be saved. He'll be in heaven. Even even though now he's leading tons of people away. No, I would say the, he is an example of someone who potentially the spirit of God was working through him. Potentially was, but was never truly knew Jesus. He knew the doctrines. The spirit of God worked through him because it was near the church. I mean, it's almost like like Abraham and Lot. You think about Abraham. He was close. Is blessed. And anybody near Abraham gets blessed. Lot suddenly gets rich and, and has all these blessings. And then you separate from Abraham. Well, what does he get? He gets condemnation. He gets destroyed. You, you see it over and over and over that those who are near the family of There's a Israel, residual there's benefit. There's a residual benefit. But then it, over the generations, they're destroyed. You see that with Esau. You see that with um, some of those, you know, like Dan. Dan was, even the tribe gets rejected completely as an apostate tribe. Uh, you, there's some weird symbolism throughout the Old Testament that indicates that there's a, there is this sense of people who are among you that are going to become wolves. Yeah. And that's what Paul warns the elders in Acts. So the, I believe in a once saved, always saved. I, it's just it's a logical reality the, the, yeah, the, that if you are truly saved that there is a that god and what i and i think somebody who's truly saved is going to end up living and following jesus and knowing jesus and walking with jesus and developing the mind of jesus and the life after jesus and that may be a long distance it may be a short distance but there are those among us that while maybe manifesting gifts which is not evidence of salvation anywhere in the scriptures mm-hmm. remember giftedness does not equate yeah, to, to do with equipping god yeah, it does not actually equate to actually the um, love or anything. <laughs> love or these or things. loyalty. And now there's there's a difficulty there because it does say that you're in the body of Christ. So, but you're near it. You're tasting it. I, it, it there's just a question: Is there a place for the 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 person near Jesus to manifest? But, and then when they walk away, even though the Spirit of God worked through you, you are still saying no, no, I don't know. This Jesus thing isn't real. And man, that's that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's and it would indicate there's no returning for those people. Now, I don't think that's everybody. I think there are people who are kind of like they're kind of fishing around at the church, but they've never truly yet received the word yet. You know, it's not really penetrated. So yeah, I I think uh, people what they worry about and the reason why they want people to feel secure in their faith is there are those people who feel like 
you know, I, I, am I really saved? Am I really saved? And they're constantly in a state of worry. And I think for those people, um, it's like being so worried you're going to cheat on your marriage. You know what I mean? That you kind of in a constant state of never enjoying the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, I think part of the problem is, is that you need peace from spending more time with God so that he, that you know that he loves you. And then you respond and it doesn't mean you're a perfect person. It doesn't mean that you've fixed all your problems, but you don't want to ever be like, well, everything's just okay. I can do whatever I want and God's going to love me anyway because that wouldn't be in a relationship. So when you make it relational instead of some kind of abstract concept, it's easier to understand. Like you and you would never like, oh, does does my family member love me? Well, you kind of know, you know, and, and so there's this idea that like there's a loyalty aspect, there's a sacrificial aspect to it, there's a willingness to want to grow the relationship. If those are a part of your of daily uh, concerns and the way you struggle with things, then you really don't have much to worry about. It's when you work worry but you really don't want to resolve the worry so some people worry oh, am i saved i go well what are you doing it's like am i really a good husband uh, well are you cheating on your wife are you doing all these bad things to harm treating her, do you really, her well treating you? yeah i mean you're gonna know it's not like a shock all of a sudden you're like oh for some people it is you know because yeah, of the way life is yeah i think it's important but, that we remember that um there the other thing is that your salvation is not based on your faith in your faith yeah this is one of those that's why i like the word dependence a little bit right now it's one of like my favorite ideas on it like we've used allegiance where it's like i pledge allegiance to you jesus that gives more of that sense of like action in following jesus like i pledged allegiance to him i'm, I'm dedicated to him i'm gonna do or go where he goes but what i like about dependence is dependence is more like what we mean by faith it's like i trust you i depend on you i depend on you for my salvation where else am i gonna go you have the words of eternal life and jesus and god is dependable to us he's faithful and faithfulness so i'm and so when i'm dependent i have to sit down in the chair i have to put my whole weight in it i'm depending on it i'm dependent on your righteousness i'm dependent on your forgiveness yeah i'm leaning on it your power so i can get through something i'm dependent upon you doing something in my life i'm dependent that is the state of the of the disciple is somebody why do i lean in because i'm dependent on you teaching me i don't understand unless you tell me i'm dependent upon you guiding me because i'm not i'm not i'm i can't be wise until you've taught and i've got to depend on your wisdom and so there's this power and dependence that not independence but power within dependence being dependent yeah that um that is present now i think what happens is there's some people who skate in and they go well wow, my 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 dependence isn't dependent enough well, that sounds kind of weird doesn't yeah. it like you know you're dependent upon your own dependence that's the problem i see people like get this mixed up where it's like do i have enough faith it's not about your faith do you trust god it's about whether god is faithful not whether you have enough faith in him mm-hmm. Like there's, it's not like a faith meter goes off. So that's, um, we've talked about this before, but it's a critical reiteration at this point, mm. because I think if you are trusting in your faith, yeah, you're going to feel like, oh no, yeah, am like, I saved? Am I not saved? It, it's and, an odd abstract. It's like saying, I'm trusting in marriage, but are you trust in your spouse and they trust in you? No, I'm trusting in the marriage. Like, well, doesn't that involve the relationship that you two have and the choices that you two make? Do no. I trust her enough? Do I trust my yeah. wife enough right now? Because, I, I mean, if I don't trust her enough, we're not married. It's like, th- okay, that, that's not how that works. You made right. a vow. Like, the vow sealed the deal. Now go live it. Uh, yeah. And that's really kind of the case here. It's like, it's not about how much you trust it's about living and, and, and being and, and being faithful to the vow when you screw it up come back to the vow when you you know are you going to live out the vow ultimately in the end we've made a vow to jesus some do not live out the vow does that mean they were saved or not saved in god's eyes that's up to god god knows can there be people who have literally said ah and messed their lives up and look like they were absolute sinners and, and commit suicide then they were pastors oh my gosh are they apostates again i think this is up to god i think yeah, there's, there's lots a final of, judgment like, there's i don't know too many people who who don't have sin in their life when they die you know and, and that doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation because that's not what it's talking about i think this is a willful act of, of somebody telling god i'm done i don't believe in you even though you'd been a part of it and so when that happens, when that willful act occurs, I don't think there's any um, there's any return. I don't I don't see my friend returning. I don't see any reason to try. I mean, you can preach, you can do everything you can. God will 
pursuit, but I think his heart is so solidly hardened. This this looks like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit to me. Mm. So that's really what I see, and that's I don't think. I think these things can go together. I don't think we understand how they go together because we're talking on God's perspective of time outside of time or in eternity, in time, his time, whatever that is. Um, however you put that together. <laughs> and then us in our time where we can't know the end, we, we have to wait for somebody to be faithful. And there's no reason to believe that we should be the ones judging. Um, Not the final destination. And, and, and I would say too, too that, early. you know, just like... You can look at somebody's marriage and just go, oh, my gosh, they have the perfect marriage. And and that's all you know uh, from what you see. And then you find out they're getting a divorce, right? Yeah. And you don't know what all is going on. All you can do is, is base your, your perception on what you see. God knows everything. He's the one that that judges. He's the one that chooses to forgive or not forgive. He's the one that understands the whole picture, absolutely. And so, so again, we we kind of look at things from from a two dimensional standpoint, and he mm-hmm. looks at things from a multi dimensional. Yeah. Um, and and so, kind of in talking about this, talking about the the seeds um, that were scattered in the in the soils, um, it, it kind of leads into one of the questions that we had right here, and uh, and it was talking about how do you bear fruit, and how do you multiply. Right. Well, I think that again, classically, you receive this. You receive the word by giving your life to Christ, by making the vow. The you know, making making the vow of a good conscience, as uh, First Peter calls it. Right. The the attempt to say, I am, I am a sinner in need of you, Jesus. I am depending upon you and your work and nothing else. So that on the day of judgment, all I have is I go. I don't. I don't have anything, Lord, except what you gave me in Jesus and God goes and the father says, great, come on in. You know, that's, that's, that's all I've got. And so you got the vow and that's, I think how you receive the word. That's what changes you. That's the deep soil, the good soil. Um, and I think then it's, you're going to naturally bear fruit. And what I mean by that is the spirit of God's going to work in your life that you're going to notice, not do gifted things. I, I don't really, that's, that's to serve each other, carry each other as part of the, but you're going to do so good skills. Works. You're going to you're going to salt the land. No, that's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. You're going to be salt and light. This idea that you're going to engage in the good works from good character. There's going to be love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self control. That are not just internal experiences. No, these have external realities. That when you're in traffic, you're more patient than you've ever been. That when you're actually out in life, you're joyful. It's coming through you. You're self-sacrificing on behalf of another person. That there is this real sense that, ah, there's this peace about you. That you can you adjudicate and you love the good and the righteous and the right, right, on these concepts. And then you fight for them. You step in. You try to, at the sacrifice of your own life, you try to heal. You try to deal with somebody. You try to help something. Those are the good works that come from the good things and so you're merciful you don't judge somebody because they cut you off you're you're just you're kind of like at a state of dependence upon the lord and he bears these fruits the second part is you're you make a disciple you share the gospel with someone and that when you're sharing the gospel and you're sharing the seed when they receive it the scripture indicates that's a fruit you're bearing fruit it's multiplying you a disciple makes a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple. Um, that's that's multiplication. That's the core of the Great Commission. That makes sense because the answer I had about multiplying was, generally speaking, if I'm multiplying by ones or tens, I can do it in my head. Mm. But if it's like any other numbers that I'm trying to multiply, I've got to use a calculator. But your answer made a lot more sense. <laughs> oh, so, thanks. Yeah, yeah. glad you can answer that. <laughs> Um, all right, so we got another question. Um, are we not, this is a podcast question, are we not supposed to pray to the Holy Spirit? Oh, so, so we're going to move into questions. So we're going to move into questions. Okay. We're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. And we got a couple Are of we questions. not supposed to pray to the Holy Spirit? We're not not supposed to not pray to the Holy Spirit, yeah. considering <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not not with us. The answer but to that is no, <laughs> but no to your not, not no to. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm voting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, which proposition, proposition is this? this? <laughs> so, Stephen, go ahead. Why don't you tag that just for fun? Uh, do I pray to the Holy Spirit? Um, there are people that try to 
use the discipline of only praying to the Father. I, I don't see that as an explicit instruction in Scripture anywhere, that you can, you're can you only supposed to pray to the Father. And so um, I know that you ultimately can pray to the, the figure of the Godhead. I think that, that you want to attribute whatever their personhood to, I guess. So like I, I for the the... the, the the Holy Spirit's called the Comforter. So if I'm praying for comfort and guidance, I'm typically going to pray to the Holy Spirit. If I'm praying for being intercession before the Father and and thankfulness for what what Christ did, I'm going to respond to Him directly. And so to the Father, I thank you for you know being a bringing me into the family of God and providing salvation as a means. And and so I, I do often like to pray to the right. Um, person in the Godhead because it's just a matter of respect and I want to see how scripture defines them differently it's a it's a helpful thing if you're praying publicly so you don't mm-hmm. pray heresy um, I know it sounds a little bit uh, I guess like uh, for some people it sounds a, a little bit legalistic but I find it to be beneficial for my faith because of the fact that um, I want to make sure that I attribute to God things that are respectful and so for me I find it as a way to be respectful others felt like the best way to be respectful is to only talk to the father and you know if you feel that conviction I'm fine with that I just don't think it's something that you should instruct everyone to have to do yeah I, I will say I think early in my faith I had the understanding that we pray to the father in the the work of Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So pray to the Father in the authority of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I kind of felt like that's what you did, you know? Um, so you had long and, prayers, but I would say, right? Before <laughs> you start, before you start, you always have to do a cleansing sigh, as you know. <sighs> yeah, Lord, yeah. Father, God, you know? Um, and and I make fun because that's kind of what I do. Yeah, that's but what you do. That yeah. is what I do. Um, but, but I have... Uh, I, I like your perspective, and I have I've moved to that perspective as I've grown in my faith. Is number one, uh, and I think I probably attribute that to Greg a lot. If I'm being kind here, is where I started contemplating it a lot. Yeah. But um, you know, just the idea of there is one God. There are three persons, so they all have a role in our salvation. They all have a role in you know uh, in our in our faith. And so, why would I exclude? two out of the three, you know, in that regard. Um, and But the one thing in that mentality, too, of, of praying to one of the persons of the Trinity um, really empowered my prayer um, and real, it made me realize, too, how, how mindlessly I did pray. Because I would find myself at times going, oh, Lord, Father, God, Thank you for dying on the cross <laughs> and, you know, and giving me the power to conquer sin. And, and it's like, I'm totally confusing the persons and the roles and speaking to one about the other. And it's helped me to be more clear and more precise in my, in my prayers as to who I'm speaking to and, and what I'm asking for. And so... Yeah, I think that it's not wrong to pray to the Holy Spirit, like we just said. It's right. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're one God. And when you're speaking to God in general, you're talking to the Holy Spirit. It's just, I mean, most of the time we think of God the Father when we're saying God. But I do have this tendency to believe that, um, like like you said, I talk to the Spirit for what he will do. I talk to, the, to Jesus for what he has done, and I talk to and I ask the Father for what he can do. So I do. I ask the Spirit for wisdom because he's the Spirit of wisdom. I ask for him for comfort. I ask him to for guidance. Um, now, I can talk to the Father, and I oftentimes just I worship the Father. I kind of praise the Father. He's the, the – it's, it's kind of the – he's the majesty, the greater one in that sense. And I, when I speak to him, I speak to him in the name of the Son, like and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes – that just means I'm just kind of like, God, I don't know what to say. And then I listen. And the Spirit of God speaks back to us. It's really interesting in the book of Acts is you can be praying to the Father, and the Spirit talks back. The Father doesn't talk back. Jesus doesn't talk back. The Spirit does. And then sometimes Jesus shows up in the book of Acts and starts talking to talking to guys. So really, I don't have a, a, I just don't think it's wrong to talk to God. 
God's not going to yeah. hold it against you. I also think if you're new to the faith, it takes a while to to figure out what that's like to pray. So if you accidentally do something wrong, God's not going to be like, well, you prayed to the wrong person of the How God. So I can't figure that. out who you really want to send the message to or whatever. Yeah. You know, I just think that's not how God works. And I'm not trying. That's why I say it's not a legalistic thing for me. It's just. I want to respect. It's like you don't want to get the birth date wrong of your family member, right? Because you're like, oh, yeah, that's a little thing. It's not like, oh, if I don't, I don't love them. Mm-hmm. It just means that I just like want to grow closer to God and be familiar with how Scripture defines mm-hmm. him. So and that it's it, not like junior high school. You're going, yeah. oh, Jesus, can you tell God the Father I love him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, ask him to check the box. Does He's, he like me too? <laughs> you just do what most people do. Just say, God, and then they just leave it at God. I always feel never uncomfortable wrong. when I joke like that because I always feel like there are people that's going to go, oh, that's blasphemy. It might but be. I, I believe God has and a sense of humor. it's about the Holy Spirit, yeah. it's blasphemy. Yes. Of that's the, why I use uh, Jesus and the Father. But, you know, I, I do believe God has a, a vivid sense of humor and, uh, and, uh, and the fact that he created me is evidence of that. You know, <laughs> Either that or he makes mistakes. He either has a sense of humor or he makes mistakes, but. Uh, I like to think he's got a sense of humor. <laughs> um, all right, so another quick question. Um, we are told um, that we, we, to judge not lest we be judged, and we're told that judgment is reserved for God. Does that mean we should not judge others? So there's an important aspect in the word, in the Greek, that judgment is, is twofold. There's this concept of being discerning where you're going to make a judgment call on, you know, should I go down that dark, dark alleyway and in the middle of the night, or should I make sure I go into a lighted area and make a phone call, whatever, you know, like there's that, that's a judgment of an alleyway. You're not supposed to do that. Or you meet somebody and you, yeah, you judge them by their works. You know, they're sitting there with a gun and they pointed at you and they're bad guy. Right. Um, so there are some judgments that we need to make as part of life. And as pe- I'm just keeping discernment, it open. yeah, called discernment. And then there's judgment in the sense of ultimate con- condemnation, declaring whether or not they are destined for hell. Uh, that is outside of our realm. In fact, that's the stuff that Jesus in the in that's the what we're Sermon talking about Mount, salvation in some sense. Yeah, Sermon on the Mount. I think he he was he'd say like, how dare you judge another person's ultimate destiny? Don't call them raka. Don't call them bad names because you think that they're doomed. Paul says, I don't even judge myself until the time is right kind of stuff. So in that case, yeah, there, there's not a, you don't want to judge somebody as out because you don't like them or you see something. Well, keep it open. I mean, I'm not judging that my friend is going to, even though he's walked away, is going to end up ultimately never coming back. That doesn't mean you wouldn't still engage him. Yeah, I'd still engage him, still try, still beg. I just think that if Because you don't ultimately know until, say, he's, until he's dead. Yeah. I just worry that what the scriptures say is is about him. So there's this aspect that you don't you do need to make judgments. What you don't do is you do you don't do vengeance. Vengeance I, is not ours. Vengeance is the Lord's, and vengeance is the use of judgment, and then acting out that judgment on in your own hand. And that is not what God has called Christians to do. We're not supposed to enact judgment on our own in vengeance. He has left that to A, his own judgment, in which he will bring it about, or B, government, which he has given the power of the sword to for the sake of condemning judgment. And so, then the other yeah. one is hypocritical judging. So right. if you judge with a with a with a with a measure that's you put your thumb on the scale, you make you make it real light for you and real heavy for everyone else. We call it a double standard. Yeah, you create a double standard. That would be a form. That's the hypocrisy the Bible is forbidding you. It's like if you do that, then God's going to condemn you, and so you don't judge that way. And that's what the text is saying when people say you're not supposed to judge. I go, you need to read that passage because it's talking about a very specific kind of judging where you don't see the flaws in yourself and you're willing to point out the flaws in someone else. You don't have an equal measure of judging. You're projecting. You're, you're the standard of your own judgment, and no one is, is, everyone else is much worse than you are, and you can't see yourself. You're not submitting to the God at that point. God is the judge. We're using his judgment to make decisions, and when we do that, we have to do that from a humble position, knowing that I am a flawed person, and they are a flawed person, and I'm trying to reconcile them to God and me, not trying to be like, I am better than everyone else. I'm going to put my thumb on the scale. I have a, a miscalculating scale, and this is something all human beings, Christian or otherwise, are prone to do thinking that 
they have no humanity because they're on the wrong side of something I don't like. Um, and that would be the kind of thing that would be forbidden by the scripture. The skill that you really want to grow is patience in, in verbalizing and venting your judgment. And that's really what I would say is like, if you feel like you're a knee jerk reactionary judger, like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And then you need to pause. Jesus Pray. is calling you to say, consider yourself before you go attacking the person, consider your own driving before you yell at that guy, consider your own actions in the, with, with people before you get mad at what they're pointing. That, that is what Jesus is asking you to do. And it, it not to not make right and good, um, discernments and judgments about certain things. How judge you Brent? <laughs> And the uh, other one wouldn't be not to like to say, well, I don't want to judge myself, so I'll never judge anyone. And you're just lifting both sides of the scales, yeah, and you're also misrepresenting God's truth. You know, it's like you have to put the weight of what something is on it, or you'll just hurt people in another sense. And kind of what you were talking about, and I, you know, I, I agree with it. You know, that putting your thumb on the scale for other people make, and judging them heavier than yeah. you judge yourself, and and a lot of times, I don't think that's a conscious no aspect, a, right? I think. I can do a behavior and in my mind think that I'm a good person and I can rationalize why what I did wasn't that bad. And I can see the exact same behavior in somebody else, but because I don't have that ability to rationalize for them, I judge them harshly, you know, for the same thing. And that's yeah. really what the scriptures are saying. Examine yourself, you know, don't don't just you know, don't rationalize your poor behavior and then condemn someone else for it. And I also don't think it's saying if somebody is doing a, condem a condemning behavior, don't ignore it, yeah. you know? So, so there is that aspect of deal with yourself first, understand your biases and, and, uh, and your rationalizations and the allowances that you give yourself and show the same grace towards someone else. Because those bad behaviors that are in me, although I can rationalize them or excuse them to some degree, I do know they're bad, and yeah. I do know I need to grow and change, but I just don't judge myself as harshly. And so on the other side, too, show them that same grace, you know, that help them point, see that this is a bad or toxic behavior, but also don't condemn them and, you know, strike them down, you know, help build them up. Yeah, part yeah. of that to me is just the fact that they're not my scales, they're God's. Yeah. So if false scales would be my own, but God's scale judges all people the perfectly. And so you're trying to to do things the way God would view them. And that's the way you're supposed to look at other people. Um, and not, not excuse the behavior, but, but to try and tell people that you're trying, I'm here to help. I'm here to mm -hmm. try and both of us surrender to this standard and both of us will be good in the long run. The only scales we have, according to Scripture, are the scales that are on our eyes, so maybe they <laughs> fall off. That's all. I, I wow. Know. Well, yeah. you can judge us uh, <laughs> yeah. by sending us an email at... Uh, and, uh, Thumbs down this one. Yeah, I'm you can judge go you ahead guys. and judge us online. <laughs> what's, what's exactly what we're doing all the time. We're a, we're a welcome... We welcome the judgment. Anyway, <laughs> we're just glad you guys did join us. And if you have any judgment to throw our way or any thoughts about things or even some questions about what we've covered or maybe even if you're catching up on old podcasts and you're like, hey, I, I really am curious about uh, this subject or the politics thing or whatever drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at rabbittrail at obcc.church. That's rabbittrail at obcc.church. There's no the at the beginning. There's no none of that. It's just rabbit trail. So it, maybe you send us something that didn't get to us. That's why um, somebody else out there is getting it. But then we're just glad that you would be joining us. And we hope that you have a God-blessed rest of your week. Chuck Luck. Bye. Bye.